Yes. Thank you very much. On that note, we'll get started. We have a great learning case uh, for you guys today. And so we'll begin with a case presentation. We present a case of a 67-year-old woman with a history of Nash cirrhosis. history of NASH cirrhosis, a meld sodium score of 12, and child Q classification of A, who presented to the clinic after a recent ER visit where she was complaining of right upper quadrant abdominal pain and left lower quadrant abdominal pain. During the course of her ER evaluation, she had a CT scan which showed some concerning abnormal abdominal findings. Her CT scan was followed up uh, with an MRI of the abdomen. And as you can see here, it showed a 4 centimeter by 3.7 centimeter lesion in segment two of the liver in the left lobe of the liver. And it showed, although it's not visible or apparent on this image here, that there were findings that were consistent with arterial enhancement and venous washout concerning for hepatocellular carcinoma. Given these concerning findings, the patient underwent a CT scan of the chest and a bone scan, both of which were negative for the presence of metastasis. The case was subsequently presented in our tuber board conference just weeks later. And at that time, the patient's case and the imaging was discussed thoroughly, at which point it was decided that the best plan of action would be to perform Y90 radioembolization as a bridge to a liver transplant. And as per the protocol before we began the Y90, oh, this seems to be. Prior to the commencement of the Y90 radioembolization, the patient underwent a mapping angiogram. As you can see here displayed in this image, uh, this is an image of the celiac trunk of the patient and its uh, branches. To the left here, you can see splenic artery. This is the common hepatic artery, which then divides into the gastroduodenal artery and the hepatic artery proper. If we zone in or, or zoom in onto this location here, we have another more, a better close-up image. So this is the uh, common hepatic artery, the gastroduodenal artery. What we can see here is that the hepatic artery proper is then dividing into the right hepatic artery. And then towards the left, we see the left hepatic artery, which shows a very early bifurcation. And as such, there are actually two branches of the left hepatic artery that start off very proximally. And what you can see vaguely here, which is present, is actually the right gastric artery, which seems to be coming off one of the branches of the left hepatic artery. This will become very important, especially this anatomy in the upcoming slides. As part of the uh, mapping angiogram, we also had selective catheterization and imaging of the branches of the left hepatic artery. And as you can see here with superselective catheterization and injection of the dye, that there is evidence of a tumor blush as delineated with these arrows. The patient was then scheduled for a Y90 radioembolization shortly thereafter. And here again, we are seeing that the catheter is inserted and it's passed through uh, the hepatic artery proper and into one of the branches of the left hepatic artery. You can see that there's a very vague or faint amount of tumor blush compared to the image that we had seen previously. And the patient was treated with Y90, <clears throat> Y90 therapy, excuse me. Shortly after the Y90 radioembolization, the patient went for a Bremskollung uh, SPECT imaging. And what we saw, and what we noticed was that the radiation appeared to predominantly hit the margins of the tumor as opposed to the center of the tumor itself. At this juncture, our interventional radiologists went back and reviewed the imaging and the angiogram. And they had noticed that the catheter at the time of Y90 radioembolization was actually distal to the point of bifurcation of the left hepatic artery. Thus, it was decided that it was necessary I'm to- I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. If everybody on the phone could hit um, star six, that will mute your phone. Thank you so much. Sorry. So at this juncture, 
the mapping angiograms and the imaging was, re was reviewed by our interventional radiologist. And it was determined that the catheter was placed at the time of Y90 radioembolization distal to the point of bifurcation of the left hepatic artery. And thus it was necessary for Y90 radioembolization to be performed again and the correct vessel to be <clears throat> cannulated. The patient was then called back in and the Y90 radioembolization was performed for a second time. And as you can see here, the other left hepatic artery branch was now cannulated and contrast was, ingested, was injected. And now you can see a much more clearer and a much more prominent tumor blush. This was then confirmed again with brem strahlung spect imaging. And as you can see here, compared to the previous brem strahlung spect imaging, that now there was successful targeting of the core of the tumor as opposed to just the margins of the tumor. In total, the radiation exposure to the liver with these two Y90 radioembolization procedures came out to be about 22 millicuries. On the technetium MMA, MAA testing that was done prior to the Y90 radioembolization, the lung shunt fraction was calculated at 7.7%. At this point in time, it was considered that there was successful embolization of the tumor based on the second brem strahlung spect imaging. The patient was in discharge and was to be seen a month later in the clinic for follow-up. When she was seen in follow-up one month later, she began to complain, or she was complaining rather, of difficulty swallowing, particularly both solids and liquids, specifically more to solids than liquids. She also complained of associated squeezing like chest pain shortly after she began to swallow, which was a grave concern. She also began complaining of a intermittent, severe stabbing epigastric pain with associated bloating. Given concern for these ongoing symptoms, it was decided that the patient needed to have an EGD. Here are some of the images from the EGD. As you can see in the image on the left here, that there are very prominent esophageal varices. And on the right, you will notice that there's significant oozing of blood in the antrum of the stomach. There were no distinct lesions that were noticed at this point in time, and thus this oozing at the point by the endoscopist was attributed to just portal hypertensive gastropathy and subsequent oozing because of it. Unfortunately, she continued to have intermittent stabbing epigastric pain. And thus she presented to the ER just a few weeks later with similar pain and had a follow-up EGD done shortly thereafter. And here are some images of that second endoscopy. As you can see in the images on the, on the far left, that there is evidence of some radiation gastropathy. There was also the finding of a clean-based ulcer in the fundus of the stomach. And then you'll notice here on the far right, we have a picture of the antrum of the stomach. And where we'd previously seen oozing of blood, now we were seeing more visible, more visible ulcers. At this point in time, it was decided that the patient would be put on PPI therapy and as needed caraphate in order to facilitate the healing of these ulcers. Unfortunately, over the following two months, the patient continued to have intermittent abdominal pains and had a very arduous and tumultuous course. She presented to the ER on five occasions between April and May of 2018. And this also included instances where she had suffered episodes of melanoma. She was admitted to the hospital four times during this course. Fortunately, she was able to be referred to Northwestern Memorial Hospital for evaluation for liver transplant in, uh, in the beginning of May, 2018. A very generous family member had also offered to donate and so she was considered a candidate for living donor transplantation. Given her complaints of persistent epigastric pain at the transplant center, an EGD was then performed yet again. As you can see here, this is one of the images from that EGD, that there is significant worsening and deepening of the antral ulcers that I had identified earlier on. You can see there is significant more erythema, this increase in size of the ulcers, and in duration. Biopsies were 
taken of these ulcers. And we can look at the histopathology on the, on the right of this slide. You can see here that there's certainly a facement of the epithelium. And immediately deep to it, you see these well-rounded and well-delineated spherical structures, which were found to be consistent with Y90 surge spheres within the patient's antrum. It was thought that the patient had suffered these ulcers as a result of the refluxing or as a result of the misdirection of these Y90 spheres as a result of the Y90 radioembolization, subsequently resulting in ulcers of the gastric antrum. We suspect that the mechanism of this gastric injury was as follows, and I'm bringing up this image again, which uh, may be familiar to you all, as I just brought it up a few slides earlier. If we look at the anatomy of the patient, um, specifically with regards to the common hepatic artery and the right and left um, hepatic artery branches. I had mentioned that one of the left hepatic artery branches gave off the right gastric artery. The second Y90 radioembolization procedure involved cannulation of this particular branch, which gave off the right gastric artery. The thought is that during the second Y90 radioembolization, there was some backflow or there was some redirection or misdirection of the Y90 sur spheres which then entered the right gastric artery, subsequently resulting in damage to the gastric antrum and ulceration. Following these findings, the clinical course of the patient was as follows. She was subsequently listed for liver transplantation. She underwent repeat imaging, which although showed improvement of the size of the liver lesion, which was initially four centimeters in segment two and had now been reduced to 3.4 centimeters, Unfortunately, she had a new 1.4 centimeter lesion in segment eight. And this was in the middle of July. Within a few days, uh, she was, it was arranged for her to have a living donor liver transplantation, which was successfully carried out. At the same time of the transplantation, a gastrojejunostomy was also performed as a means of bypassing the ulcerated antral area. This brings up a very important point. Certainly there are many successes that are associated with Y90 radioembolization and, and the use of Y90 radioembolization is only increasing in the management in local regional therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma. However, we must remember that despite this being a very sophisticated technique, there are also some complications to keep in mind. Our presentation had focused on mainly the GI complications vis-a-vis -vis ulcers with the antrum or other parts of the stomach. However, there are other complications that we must be privy of, which include post-radiation syndrome, hepatic dysfunction, radiation-induced liver disease, a multitude of biliary adverse events, which can include bilomas, strictures, radiation cholecystitis. There's a chance of portal hypertension if there's significant fibrosis from radiation exposure, radiation pneumonitis, vascular injuries, particularly in patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, and also anterior abdominal wall pain and injury as a result of misdirection of the spheres through the falciform artery. Having said this, one may also raise the question that why was it that Y90 radioembolization was considered in this patient? Could this not have been avoided? And potentially this complication may have been avoided subsequently. And on that note, I'd like to direct your attention towards the recently published guidelines in January 2018 in hepatology on hepatocellular carcinoma, where they mention that the AASLD does suggest bridging to transplant in patients who are listed for liver transplantation within the Milan criteria in order to decrease the progression of disease and subsequent dropout from the wait waiting list. And it does not recommend one form of liver-directed therapy over the other for the purposes of bridging for patients within Milan criteria. It is worthy of mentioning that the quality and certainty of evidence that has been listed for both these recommendations is very low and the strength conditional. And on that note, I'd like to open up the forum for any further questions or discussion. Um, if you need to unmute your phone, it's um, star six. Um, 
And while people are, if there are no questions, I do want to remind everybody we are having a live HCC liver symposium being hosted by Sheila Schwarren of Rush University and Hector Farrell at North Shore on October 17th at the Illinois Medical District. That will be a CME-based program, um, and we'll go from 5.30 to 9.30, feature um, five different specialties within hepatology, talking about a single case study and how they would address that um, specific case study relating to HCC. So, um, any questions? I guess one question would be is whether the uh, radiologist uh, looked at uh, 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 reviewed uh, these uh, changes in the arterial pathways uh, prior to the um, uh, Y90. Uh, most of the time, the patient is brought in the day before or a couple of days before and, and uh, looks to see if there are any aneurysms, any uh, any. Uh, uh, alterations that might cause a problem to the lungs or to the GI tract, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure I heard uh, where they did that. They certainly did undergo a, a mapping angiogram, um, and the Y90 radioembolization was actually done a couple of weeks after the angiogram. Um, I, I think, in retrospect, the uh, they were aware of the fact that there was a bifurcation. Um, of the uh, left hepatic arteries and that the, one of them was resulting in the tumor blush. Um, and I think what was perhaps misleading was that when they did the initial Y90 radioembolization, it wasn't that they didn't see any tumor blush at all, but it's just that in hindsight, perhaps it wasn't as prominent, which is why only the periphery or the perimeter of the uh, tumor uh, was hit by radiation the first time. And then when they were able to go back again and take a look, they, they realized that they had probably gone a little bit too distal and probably the other left hepatic artery branch was the one that should have been targeted. Okay, well, if there's nothing I, else, I want to say. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I, sorry, I missed the beginning. Is How common is gastric injury? Um, and I've never seen, I've seen some of the other complications that you described in your presentation. Uh, but I've never seen uh, gastric injury. And then I guess so I was wondering how often does this happen? And then what was the long-term management of these ulcers that, that formed? Was it just TPI therapy? Yes. Yeah, so in the literature, it's mentioned that it can be seen in about 5% uh, of patients who undergo Y90 uh, radioembolization can, can develop some form of gastric injury, and particularly it's in the form of ulceration. The first line of therapy is basically aggressive uh, PPI therapy like you had mentioned. Um, and in instances in which there's no further improvement or, or if there's intractable pain or symptoms, then a surgical route is actually recommended. So surgical resection? Resection. Wow. Okay. Um, well, there's so no other... in... Go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I keep interrupting sorry. questions. <laughs> I was just wondering how, how the patient's doing now and what her current status is after all of this. The, the patient actually um, just underwent a liver transplantation on the um, 18th of July. Um, based on my uh, chart review, of, uh, she's actually doing quite well after the transplant. There haven't been any immediate post-transplant complications. Um, I believe she's still admitted at this point in time, but she's doing well. And she no longer complains of dysphagia or at least improved dysphagia? It seems that the dysphagia um, complaints had actually been, uh, I'm not sure in terms of whether they'd been mitigated or perhaps superseded by the fact that she was having such severe epigastric pain. Um, but I think the, the pain appeared to be um, improved based on um, the chart review that I was doing after the transplantation. but. Um, the dysphagia, it seems that that, that became a, a lesser issue for the patient going forward. Okay. Uh, if there are any other questions, please speak now. Otherwise, I will go ahead and conclude the program. Okay, well, I want to give a 
special thank you to uh, Cosm and uh, yes. Interesting case. Thank you for doing it. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, and Klaus for hosting um, the program today. Uh, this is being recorded. This is the first time we're attempting to record it. So if all goes well, we'll be able to post on uh, YouTube and share it with our uh, associates and colleagues as well. Um, and then just another friendly reminder about the October 17th program at the Illinois Medical District. We would love to see everybody and, and more details on that will be forthcoming. So thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, thank thank you very much. much. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you very much. Right, bye bye. Have a good evening.